Thank you all for joining us today for our briefing, Demystifying Ocean Carbon Dioxide Removal. I'm Dan Bursett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and uh, thanks for joining us in person and in our online audience. I'd like to start by thanking our friends at the World Resources Institute, WRI, for making this briefing possible with their partnership. I'd also like to say special thanks to Senator Schatz, Senator Heinrich, and their great staff, as well as the great folks at the Senate Rules Committee for help with the room today. Uh, ESI is celebrating 40 years of advancing climate solutions through congressional education in 2024. We were founded um, by a bipartisan group of members of Congress, and since 1984, we've been working to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. Climate change uh, has been around for a really long time. Congressional education has been a really run along a really run around a really long time. What does it look like? things like this, where we bring experts to Capitol Hill to meet with staff, to present on environmental energy, climate change topics. We do a lot of briefings. If you are curious in Ocean CDR, well, great, because that's what today's briefing is about, but we do lots of other briefings. Our first briefing of the year was about the Fifth National Climate Assessment. We did one a couple weeks ago with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy about the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. Every six months or so, we do a briefing taking a look at a different part of the IIJA, or the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. The last one we did was about rural programs at the Departments of Agriculture and Energy. Um, we have one coming up in a few weeks on dam safety, which will be really, really great. One in June on natural climate solutions. We try to cover the full range of issues. So mark your calendar for all of those. And also our clean energy and energy efficiency, or excuse me, our Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo is July 30th. So you won't wanna miss that. That was a lot, and um, I can see, at least in the audience, people weren't taking super copious notes as I ran through those, but that's okay. The best way to keep up with things at ESI is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It comes out every other Tuesday. If you sign up today, you'll get one next Tuesday. Um, everything also, including the session today, uh, is posted on our website, which is www.eesi.org. So if you want to go back and revisit any of the presentations or uh, additional materials, or if you want to learn about any of the other topics that your boss is working on or your boss is asking you to work on, um, that website is a really great resource. And we try really hard to be timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. We put a lot of thought to try to put these briefings on the calendar before the issues really come to a head, or in the case of this, the ocean, you know, the wave crests. Um, and it's much better, in our opinion, to have this information before we need it, before you need it. Um, I'm joined today by a number of my colleagues. We're all wearing our little lapel pins. If there are other issues that you think you would like to learn more about, whether it's in a briefing or a podcast or an article or an issue brief or a fact sheet, talk with one of us. I'm sure that we can help you answer your boss's questions uh, about the topic. But today we're all about ocean carbon dioxide removal. Ocean CDR is the practice of removing and storing carbon from the ocean. This topic and its potential as a climate solution is garnering increasing scientific, governmental, and private sector interest, as evidenced by it being the subject of an ESI briefing. What we're here to discuss are all the things policymakers need to understand before scaling CDR up. While federal funding for research, development, and demonstration of land-based carbon dioxide removal approaches and technologies has increased significantly in recent years, the vast ocean also prevents opportunities for carbon removal to explore. What are the uncertainties of ocean CDR related to efficacy, ecosystem impacts, and governance? How big is its potential? And how quickly can we deploy it at scale with un without unleashing any unintended consequences? We have a really, really great panel today to help us understand these questions. The next slide is a quick survey. We'll have this at the end of the briefing as well. If you have any feedback about the session today, we really encourage, your, uh, we really uh, appreciate your feedback. We read every response, uh, and like I said, if you are with us at the end of the briefing, we'll also put that slide up. It only takes a couple minutes, maybe two minutes to complete. We are joined today by video remarks uh, by a very special guest. Representative Shelley Pingree represents the first district of the great state of Maine. She became the first woman elected to Congress from the district in 2008, and at present, she's a member of the Appropriations Committee, chair of the Subcommittee on Interior and Environment, and a member of the Subcommittee on Agriculture and Subcommittee on Military Construction and Veterans Affairs. She also sits on the House Agriculture Committee, which is a pretty big deal these days. Representative Pingree is a leader on many issues, including assisting survivors of military sexual trauma, strengthening the creative arts economy, and helping coastal communities address threats to their future. And we'll be joined by her in just a moment with a quick video. Thanks, Dana. Hi, 
I'm Congresswoman Shelley Pingree, representing Maine's beautiful 1st District. First, I'd like to thank the Environmental and Energy Study Institute and the World Resources Institute for bringing us all together today, whether in person or virtually, for this important discussion about the climate crisis and carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, efforts. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations are now higher than any time in the last two million years, and about 30% of the carbon dioxide we release into the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean. Given the climate crisis and the need to mitigate carbon pollution as much as we can, it's clear we must make additional investments in marine CDR, especially for study and research. Maine is renowned for its lobster and shellfish, so you can imagine we take this threat very seriously. And I'm proud of the efforts Maine has made so far to tackle this challenge, such as implementing ocean monitoring and data collection and exploring the, exploring the ability of seaweed and kelp to lower acidity in the ocean and to sequester carbon. This work will help address the growing and far-reaching threat of the climate crisis to help ensure that our ocean industries, including fisheries and the communities that depend on them, are more resilient to our changing oceans. As a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee, I've worked to increase resources for NOAA's ocean acidification program and also authored language encouraging the administration to invest in research, development, and demonstration-related microalgae carbon sequestration in the ocean. I also supported the historic Inflation Reduction Act, which invests in climate mitigation through research, which will help assess the potential of marine carbon dioxide removal. I've been pleased to see NOAA and the Department of Energy recently advance projects in the research and development of marine carbon dioxide removal technologies. There's growing interest in this space, and the Biden administration has proven to be a committed partner in working to take ocean climate action. While decreasing greenhouse gas emission re remains the most effective way to address climate impacts, Additional research and investment in marine CDR methods can play an important complementary role. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to hearing about today's discussion. Thank you, Representative Pingree and your staff for joining us today with the video remarks. Uh, it's great to see you again uh, online. Speaking of online, we have a very robust online audience today. Uh, I know that because I just looked at our Slack channel um, that tells me how many people are on our online audience, and we're doing really well. So. If you're in our online audience and you have questions for our panelists today, we have options for you to ask those questions. And the best way to do it is to send us an email. And the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K at ESI.org. Uh, you can also follow us on social media at ESI Online. We'll be uh, live streaming and covering this live on social media um, at ESI Online on Blue Sky, Inst our Instagram story, Threads, and X. For folks in the room, we'll also have an opportunity for you all to ask questions as well. And one of my colleagues will have a microphone and be willing to bring it around so that we'll um, uh, be able to, to pick up everyone's voice on the live cast. But without any further ado, we have a really great panel. I like these briefings because I get to learn a lot. And with a panel like this, I am been looking forward to this one for a while. Katie Liebling is an associate in WRI's climate program where she leads research and analysis to inform policy recommendations for scaling carbon removal approaches responsibly in the United States and globally. Previously, Katie worked on WRI's Climate Watch data platform. Katie and her colleagues at WRI have been great partners in putting together today's briefing. That is an understatement. So we're particularly looking forward to having her kick off the panel today. Katie, I'll welcome you to the lectern. The clicker is here, and I really can't wait for your presentation. And if you, I can help you with that if I need to. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, as Dan said, my name is Katie Lebling. I'm a research associate. Um, no, I'm a research associate at World Resources Institute. So we're a global nonprofit research organization that focuses on global challenges at the intersection of climate change, environmental protection and human development. Um, and I work on carbon dioxide research and, anal and analysis, uh, mainly focused on the United States. So I'm going to do a quick introduction presentation 
on some of the basics of why we need carbon dioxide removal or CDR, why we're considering the ocean as an option, and what some of the proposed ocean CDR approaches are. So I want to start with the question of why we need carbon removal, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. And when I say carbon removal, I mean approaches and technologies that can pull carbon dioxide out of the air um, and sequester them for climate relevant periods of time. So this is in contrast to carbon capture and storage, which captures emissions at an emission source like a cement plant. Um, and so you've probably seen this chart before. It's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC's latest report in 2022. Um, and we know that greenhouse gas emissions um, have been increasing steadily since the late 1800s, and we know that this is causing the worsen worsening um, extreme weather and climate impacts that we're already seeing today. We also know that we need to steeply cut emissions to get on track to meeting global climate goals, and there's strong scientific consensus that reaching those goals will require reaching net zero emissions by around 2050, which you can see on this chart as well. And that's where carbon dioxide removal comes in. Carbon removal is what puts the net in net zero. Along with reducing emissions as much and as fast as possible, we will also need to use carbon removal approaches that can pull carbon dioxide out of the air or out of the ocean, indirectly out of the air. So to put it another way, even if we stopped all emissions today, there's so much carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere that we'd still need to remove a lot to bring concentrations back down to a safer level. And as we hopefully move toward net zero, carbon removal excuse me, carbon removal will be needed to counterbalance emissions that we don't know how to abate in any other way. And after we reach net zero, it's the only way we have to remove excess CO2 that's in the atmosphere. So I want to emphasize um, that emissions reductions will play the biggest role, as Representative Pingree said, bending the shape of the curve, the blue curve here, but that we'll need carbon dioxide removal alongside of it, um, the orange underneath the line. And carbon dioxide removal cannot be a substitute for emissions reductions or an excuse to delay action to reduce emissions. Um, so before we dive into ocean CDR specifically, I also want to emphasize that carbon dioxide removal includes many different types of technologies and approaches that pull CO2 from the air and sequester it. So each of them will make sense in different places, under different circumstances, and present different benefits and risks. So you can see the approaches done on land up top here, which range from familiar things like growing trees to more nascent approaches like using machines that chemically scrub CO2 directly from the air, known as direct air capture. And the ocean CDR approaches are on the bottom. So I'll get to those in a second. Um, and just aside from soil carbon and trees on the top and coastal wetland restoration on the bottom, the rest of these approaches are relatively new or novel. Um, and so we've seen DOE invest a lot into direct air capture and some of the other novel approaches on the top, but much less funding has gone to research and development for the novel approaches on the bottom that can be done in the ocean. So why are we even talking about using the ocean for carbon dioxide removal? Um, the most obvious answer might be that the ocean covers 70% of the earth, so it provides a lot of space for different ocean CDR approaches to be done. And if we can figure out how to leverage the ocean safely and responsibly for CDR, it could provide a potentially huge scale of removal. Second, the ocean's already the Earth's largest carbon sink. It holds 42 times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere today. So it has a demonstrated capacity to hold a lot of carbon. And this has grown as it's taken up um, about 25% of anthropogenic CO2 emissions each year. Um, third, leveraging the ocean can help us diversify the range of carbon removal approaches we have at our fingertips. So we want to be developing as many approaches as we can to balance the risks and benefits of each. And because we're not sure that in, like any of them, um, they might not all turn out to be successful. So don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. Um, lastly, using ocean uh, for CDR means we don't have to reach all of our carbon removal goals just by using land-based approaches. So it can take some of the pressure off of the resources and land uh, to do those approaches. So what are some of the proposed ocean CDR, also referred to as marine CDR approaches? Um, so there's several different ways to categorize these approaches. What I have here is just a simple differentiation between biotic um, and abiotic approaches. So biotic approaches that rely on bio biology or photosynthesis um, and the abiotic approaches that don't. So I'm just going to quickly talk about two approaches so you have a little bit more detailed sense. I think other panelists might cover this 
other aspects of this as well. Um, seaweed cultivation um, is one example of a biotic ocean CDR approach. So seaweed can be purposefully grown, then harvested and sunk to the deep ocean for sequestration of the carbon that it contains. So seaweed, as it grows, takes up dissolved carbon dioxide in surface waters, and then the CO2-depleted water re-equilibrates with the atmosphere such that CO2 moves from the atmosphere to the ocean, resulting in atmosphere carbon removal. So there are some uncertainties around this, um, including how to optimize cultivation and harvesting methods, developing and improving methodologies to measure and monitor carbon sequestration, and to better understand the permanence of the sequestration. Um, and there's also several development efforts in this area. This is not a comprehensive list, but just to give you a sense that um, there's companies and other research efforts pursuing this as well. So one, one company based in the US, actually based in Maine, is called Running Tide. Um, they're uh, doing seaweed cultivation. They're working most recently off the coast of Iceland to do this. And there are other companies around the world, including Seafield, Seaweed Generation, et cetera. The Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects um, agency has also supported research on macroalgae or seaweed cultivation. Um, ocean alkalinity enhancement is an example of an abiotic or a chemical ocean CDR approach. So this involves the addition of alkaline materials, such as ground up rocks um, that react with dissolved CO2 in surface waters, storing, uh, reacting with that dissolved CO2 to form carbonates and bicarbonates that lock that carbon away. So one potential benefit of this is locally reduced ocean acidification, uh, which Representative Pingree also mentioned. Um, and several uncertainties here also, um, those include environmental impacts associated with potential introduction of trace minerals that could be harmful in the rock that's used when you apply that, environmental impacts associated with um, accessing uh, this material on land, potentially mining this material and transporting it, and then like most ocean CDR approaches, measurement, reporting, and verification is also challenging. So there are several developments here as well. Um, a company called Vesta, based in the US, adds ground olivine rock to coastlines and ocean water. Um, the Carbon to Sea Initiative is a nonprofit focusing on advancing research here. Um, and Pacific Northwest National Lab is also working on research and testing. Um, so as we think about the potential and next steps for ocean CDR, I just want to talk about a few complexities that are helpful to be aware of um, and that hopefully more research and development funding will help us resolve. But um, at the moment, there's generally a small knowledge base around the proposed ocean CDR approaches. Most are just beginning to be tested and piloted at sea. So there are remaining questions about how effectively that they, how effectively they can sequester carbon and under what conditions, as well as what impacts they might have on the environment and coastal communities. The ocean is interconnected and moving, so impacts would also not always be contained in one area. And the fact that the ocean is always moving can make measurement, reporting, and verification difficult and expensive. Um, the governance and regulation of ocean CDR can also be challenging because the frameworks that we have today, both in the US and internationally, weren't necessarily written with ocean CDR in mind. Um, and so they're being kind of retroactively applied uh, and there's room for improvement to be more comprehensive and proactive there. Um, lastly, because of the cultural significance and emotional significance the ocean holds, public perception and social license will be particularly important. But along with all these complexities and uncertainties, there's huge potential. And so that's why we're here today, and that's why this topic has gotten so much interest. So with more investment to help resolve these scientific and regulatory uncertainties and challenges, Ocean CDR could potentially provide multi-gigaton scale removal in future decades. The National Academy of Sciences did an assessment a couple of years ago that points to this huge potential scale, but also mentions a lot of uncertainty around their estimates. So focusing more attention on Ocean CDR would help um, could also help the U.S. maintain its position as a technological um, development and innovation leader in the world. So this would involve both increased funding to help do the research that we need to resolve the uncertainties, as well as clarifying and improving permits, permitting process to enable that research to happen. Um, and some approaches, as I mentioned, can provide non-carbon benefits, like reducing ocean acidification, replenishing ecosystems, and then the last point here, providing jobs and economic benefits. So I'll stop here and pass it to uh, next panelist.
Katie Ludling. Thank you. Sorry for mispronouncing your last name. I, oh, I, I try, but never. It has to be one. So hopefully I got it out of the way. Sorry about that. But that was a really great presentation. Really appreciate it. And I'm pretty sure that you brought some materials as well and put them on the front table. So if you missed the WR resources on the front table, I definitely encourage you to grab those uh, on your way out because um, you wouldn't want to miss those. Um, our next panelist also brought materials on the front table, and you won't want to miss those either. Savita Bowman is a Senior Program Manager of Carbon Management at ClearPath, uh, leading the organization's carbon dioxide removal and carbon capture, utilization and storage initiatives, and supporting industrial decarbonization for steel and concrete. In this role, Savvy works to guide legislative efforts, including through new policy development and manage stakeholder engagement with policymakers, government, industry, and coalitions. Before joining ClearPath, Savvy was a business resolution analyst at Tesla, where she managed pre-litigation solar and storage assets across North America and conducted risk mitigation assessments to resolve issues ranging from system performance discrepancies to contractual disputes. Savvy, thank you for joining us today. I'll tee up your slides and turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to get this right. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Appreciate that. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. It's, as you mentioned, a gorgeous day in D.C. Um, so my name is Savvy Bowman, Senior Program Manager for Carbon Management at ClearPath. And for those of you unfamiliar with ClearPath, we are a D.C.-based nonprofit, and we work on Federal uh, Policy Solutions for Climate. And we were founded by Jay Faison. He's a North Carolina entrepreneur who decided to get into the intersection of uh, climate and policy. And so we work a lot on bipartisan solutions in Congress. Um, so I know we've covered sort of the, the basics of Ocean CDR. I think what I'm going to really take us through here today is the policy behind it and what's happening in Congress today. So I'll start with the appropriations allocations that have been provided to Marine CDR and then work to the authorizations as well. So in fiscal year 24, we were, um, it, we were pleasantly surprised to see a lot of uh, resources allocated for Marine CDR. In the commerce, justice, and science language, we received uh, allocations for blue carbon research, and that was $2 million in the consolidated report language, which allows uh, NOAA to assess carbon sequestration potential for blue carbon. And it was mentioned slightly uh, before, but blue carbon is the aquatic sources for biomass. So think of like seaweed, macroalgae, um, that sort of thing, mangroves, that kind of thing. Um, and then the National Science Foundation also in the Senate report language received resources to support U.S. Global Change Research Program and Clean Energy Technology to support research into marine CDR uh, broadly. There was a lot of allocations as well for CDR um, as a whole. So think of on-land uh, pathways like direct air capture, mineralization, but marine CDR was also called out in this. Then for the National Oceanographic Partnership Program, which is a great program, I'm sure my colleague Gabby is gonna cover in a little bit, um, received 2.5 million in the Senate report for partnership program, but $500,000 particularly for ocean-related carbon removal activities for partnerships there. And then moving forward into the energy and water language, this was actually um, really interesting to see that for the first time we were getting allocations for permitting clarity. So something that uh, my colleague Katie mentioned is that there's not a clear regulatory pathway at the moment for getting marine CDR projects in the ocean to get tested. And so one of the things that I'll cover in a later slide is the uh, Marine CDR Fast Track Action Committee. They are tasked with looking at how to deploy marine CDR broadly, but also one of their scopes is to figure out the permitting question. And in the appropriate language for fiscal year 24, we received allocations 250,000 for uh, the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management to lay that out. There's also allocations for marine CDR uh, at FECM to do RD and D, and that was 10 million um, for FECM. If you look back a year as well for fiscal year 23, there's been some pretty good resources allocated there as well. Um, Having said that, I will caveat that this is not uh, consistent with 
if you look back more than like 2021. These resources are very much newer, and a lot of folks have uh, started highlighting the value of the innovation, the technology, and that's where Congress has really seen uh, the value of supporting a lot of these these technologies to further provide the research and development uh, resources needed, as well as the permitting clarity that's needed as well. So a couple other sort of resources that were allocated in fiscal year 23 were $5 million for NIST, and then um, NOAA to provide more support uh, for marine CDR technologies. Uh, the Department of Interior to $2 million allocated uh, as part of the geologic carbon sequestration uh, initiative that they were tasked with in the infrastructure package. Uh, this would essentially allow the geologic injection of CO2 um, underground in the ocean. So underground under the seafloor. <laughs> And then there's also uh, NOP, which received $7 million for partnership program, and Fossil Energy, which received $15 million. So great resources, all in all. And then looking into more of the authorizations, this slide actually shows you all of the CDR enacted policies. And then in bold, you'll see all of the marine CDR uh, relevance. So starting all the way back to the Energy Act of 2020, there was a refresh for the first time in I think like 12 or 13 years for energy policy uh, work in the U.S. And it was great because we modernized a lot of DOE's program initiatives. Uh, we started looking more at CDR broadly. And then there's the CDR task force and report, which was uh, stood up to look at how we would deploy CDR technologies in the U.S. And one of the technologies which was listed was direct ocean capture. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with direct ocean capture, it's directly removing CO2 from the seawater, and that's through a process called electrochemical separation, which is a little technical, but it gets the CO2 out. And then in the infrastructure package, that's where the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act was amended to provide regulatory support for CO2 injection geologically. Then following in the Chips and Science uh, Bill, we had a couple allocations for CDR, as well as um, $1 billion to carry out carbon removal R D and d at FECM. And we had also the IRA, but unfortunately there were no marine CDR provisions in that package. So looking at what's moving in Congress, it, you'll see in parentheses, uh, there's the 117th Congress and the 118th Congress. That's how they're broken out. Uh, but on the leftmost, the, we have the Remove Act, which is a coordination bill, which would help the federal agencies that are relevant for marine CDR and CDR broadly to coordinate with each other to get marine CDR deployed. Either it would be for the research aspects or for the permitting clarity or for the in-ocean testing, but this coordination would help support a lot of what's needed to understand the technology better. Then going back to uh, Congresswoman Pingree's remarks, or actually no, Dan's remarks, uh, where we are trying to crest this wave, the CREST Act, actually provides resources and direction for our D&D uh, on marine CDR. And that is uh, extended to direct ocean capture, which I mentioned earlier, macro and microalgae, which is seaweed, and ocean alkalinity enhancement. And then following that in the second title, there's the uh, advanced market commitment, which essentially sends the demand signal needed to ensure innovators that there is, um, there is sort of a demand it for their technology, um, depending on the cost of the solution and all of that. And the CREST Act is, uh, has been introduced in the Senate by Senator Collins and Cantwell um, and, and has other co-sponsors as well. So it's a bipartisan package um, that's moving in the 118th Congress. And then lastly here, we have the Ocean Restoration Research and Development Act. And that was uh, very recently introduced by Representative Buddy Carter. And that's a pilot program to facilitate research on ocean restoration, carbon removal, uh, and carbon storage, rd and So Dan mentioned we brought some uh, paper for y'all to have a look at. Something ClearPath has been working on is a report to identify the permitting roadblocks that currently exist and how can we create more of a streamlined look at who the right agencies are to permit these, these activities and what is the current landscape today. And so the report highlighted three main takeaways. And the first being that federal policies can really help the U.S. secure a leadership position in this innovation space. Uh, as you know and, and have seen in previous slides, CDR is becoming 
a very highly authorized and, and supported uh, solution in the U.S. And so a lot of innovators, innovators are actually flocking to the U.S. And so companies like Running Tide, like Project Vesta, are all looking for the support to continue their research here. And providing, number two, the parallel development of a regulatory framework um, is essential to have to get that to happen. Because right now, um, to my knowledge, there's only two projects that have begun researching in the water how their technology would work. One is Captura, which has a permit in the Port of LA, and it's a nonprofit general research permit uh, where they get to understand how their technology would work. And then as well as Project Vesta, which does beach nourishment where they have olivine to um, remove the carbon through wave action. Um, and then lastly, federal policy mechanisms like financial incentives can help MCDR projects um, bridge that valley of death, essentially. So ensuring that pr projects right now that need the support, particularly in the form of grants or cost sharing, um, would be critical to help support uh, early stage rd and so looking at the future outlook, there's three main things I think that could be really critical to support the field today. Permitting clarity through the MCDR Fast Track Action Committee, which I mentioned earlier. So the Fast Track Action Committee is an initiative that's ongoing. Uh, they actually have a comment period right now, which allows you to provide comments on what, they're, what should be considered as we are coming up with uh, MCDR approaches what are the regulatory uh, factors to consider as well? And how do we get the clarity we needed? Uh, because, for example, if you wanted to do marine um, CDR for macroalgae, you would have to go through what's called an ocean waste dumping permit, which is not the same thing as what marine CDR is. It's a very different activity, which means that the public perception then changes on what that activity is, and that can really negatively impact the technology itself. Also, there's not clarity on which agencies to currently go to. And there has been a lot of uh, progress that has been made. Uh, EPA has issued a page that provides that clarity, um, but it's still very much an unknown and there's a lot more work to be done. Also, building out the RD&D resources at NOAA and DOE to continue researching and developing this technology is needed, as well as the enabling legislation. So looking back a couple slides to the CREST Act, which would provide the direction to actually start researching this technology um, would be critical to help, help this technology succeed in the U.S. And with that, I will end my remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks. That was a, a very excellent presentation. Um, as a reminder, uh, we will have time uh, with our expert panel today for questions. So if you're in our online audience and you're thinking of questions, send us an email. Uh, the email address to use is askask at esi.org or follow us on social media at ESI Online. If you're here in the room, save your questions and we'll get to them and have uh, one of my colleagues will bring around a mic and we'll have a really great discussion. I'm really looking forward to that. Our third presenter today is Edward Sanders. Edward is Chief Operating Officer of Aquatic, which is committed to achieving gigaton scale ocean-based carbon removal. Uh, prior to Aquatic, Edward was a group executive at one of the world's fastest growing airlines and has worked for the Boston Consulting Group and Bain & Company, advising clients in aviation, infrastructure, travel, and sustainability. Edward, thank you for joining us at our briefing today. Um, uh, I'll turn the lecture over to you. Thanks. So we have two global challenges. Um, the first is ending fossil fuel reliance, and the second is removing legacy carbon emissions. Aquatic solves both. We use the oceans to do it. So aquatic produces green hydrogen using the ocean, and we remove carbon dioxide using the ocean. Producing hydrogen is really important because, as we've heard so far, and we know that the number one priority is a reduction in the emissions and decarbonizing big chunks of industry will need hydrogen. It's not enough. And the second element, removing legacy emissions, is something that all IPCC scenarios have said is required. How we do it matters. So it needs to be done in a way that is 
at a low cost, so accessible, that's going to be irreversible, measurable, credible, and without having negative impacts on the environments in which we are doing it. And that's why Aquatic uses the ocean. So we have a process that utilizes the fact that the world today, 80% um, of the world's carbon is in the ocean. We use electrolysis and a direct air contact step to capture the CO2 from both the ocean and the atmosphere and store it. And we store it as two things. The first is calcium carbonate solids. Um, this is from the Port of Los Angeles where we're operating our pilot today. The second is bicarbonates, dissolved ions, which um, you wouldn't be able to see. They are in the seawater as uh, in the ionic form. This allows us to do efficient, permanent, planetary scale removals. It's energy advantage because we're using the ocean and producing hydrogen as part of the product. We can use it in many different locations. So siting is less of a concern than other CDR pathways, particularly many of the terrestrial or land-based pathways. Critically, the removal permanence is 10,000 years to 1 billion years. When it's out, it's out. We don't have to have CO2 transportation because we are changing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the carbonates and the bicarbonates. We don't need CO2 storage and we don't have risks of degassing. So how do we do it? So the process begins by pumping in seawater to our plant and we measure what the carbon content of that seawater is. We then run an electrical current through the system and it splits the seawater into four things, into hydrogen gas, oxygen, oxygen gas, a base and an acid. The base, we react with the air and that traps the CO2 as carbonates and bicarbonates. The acid, we react with rock to ensure we don't have any ocean acidification occurring as part of the process. We then measure the seawater again and that allows us to determine what the net carbon dioxide removal is before we discharge it. We then monitor the discharge and we sell the carbon dioxide credit based on the net change in carbon between the start of the process and the end of the process. If this perhaps looks familiar to something that you may have seen before, it's because we are actually accelerating a naturally occurring process. So this process mimics what the natural CO2 storage pathway is. Oceans have absorbed between 25, some people say 30% of the total anthropogenic emissions each year, and rain gets neutralized by dissolving rock on its path to the ocean. What's so different about aquatic is that we have a process that operates inside of a purpose-built coastal plant that allows us to do, to do two things. We can dramatically accelerate the rate of the carbon dioxide removal, and we can measure it precisely. If we don't measure it, we can't sell it. So we need to be able to measure it precisely. By way of example, at the 30 megawatt size, which is the next size up from what we are building now, we remove one tonne of carbon dioxide every five minutes. The equivalent area of open ocean would take 12 months to do that same one ton of removals. What we mean by high quality CDR is really important to articulate. Um, and there's six key elements. It needs to be measurable. And I've talked about that so far. Secondly, it needs to be verifiable. Aquatic has an ISO standard in place for the way in which we do our monitoring our quantification and the reporting requirements of that carbon dioxide removal. It needs to be permanent, 10,000 plus years of permanence. It needs to be additional. This process itself only occurs because we have a engineered solution. It's nothing which would happen otherwise, but for the fact there's a market there, credits there to sell into. It needs to be energy efficient, we have a best-in-class system because we produce uh, hydrogen as part of the product. 
And so that allows us to have a much more scalable, lower cost CDR credit to sell. And finally, it has to be credible. Um, the market is growing rapidly. And we've seen some of the challenges in the offset market where credibility hasn't been there. We want to do it differently. And Ocean gives us a chance to do that, to rely on data rather than speculative estimates in how we generate our credits. So where are we doing it? We've got two pilots operating. They've been operating for over one year now. The first one's in Los Angeles. The second one is in Singapore. They've been doing about 100 kilograms a day of removal each and producing green hydrogen. The plant we're constructing now is the world's largest ocean-based CDR plant. That's got a capacity of 3,650 tonnes and will come online this year and be completed next year. The plant after that is commercial scale. That's got a timeline around the end of 2026. And at that scale, we're producing um, about 100,000 tonnes of removals a year, an equivalent amount of hydrogen. I think on the policy and regulation, regulation side, um, there's a couple of points that are helpful as far as how we see it. Um, this only happens in terms of community if the CDR and the green hydrogen are accessible. Uh, there is not enough public information about this um, and Aquatic would welcome um, seeing more publicly available information about the co-benefits. For instance, we do produce calcium carbonate, which can be used for beach replenishment, particularly where there's vulnerable communities, and to be able to make a carbon negative source of replenishing coastal zones on site is something that would have a large benefit to communities where we deploy. Secondly, around permitting, um, we do want to see the right resources, tools, and systems and policies for this. Many CDR companies can operate today under existing permits. Aquatic can operate today under existing permits. What needs to happen is a more efficient permitting process. And this looks like a couple of things, clearer timelines and a um, more effective intra-agency collaboration, particularly between NOAA, EPA, DOE, NSF. There's a lot more that's being done together and we are hearing a lot of support for this, which is really encouraging for us because it is going to require that collaboration. Um, we would ask for a, a multi-agency pre-permitting consultatory process, one in which we can bring data and our objectives for the plant um, and one in which the decisions are taking consideration the net impact of the aquatic process, including the risk of inaction. Um, on employment, aquatic um, was developed using the support from DOE, um, and we would encourage other similar programs that really invest in innovation. They can be catalytic for jobs. We've retrained um, teams to work on the anodes for aquatic, um, and we see there's a lot of jobs across the whole supply chain as aquatic develops. And finally, on demand signals. Um, you know, in the past 12 months alone, there has been a lot of support for CDR as part of the overall portfolio for the US. Um, marine CDR should receive the same types of commercialization and technology support that the federal government provides to other CDR pathways. Um, we cannot do this alone. Um, we do need to have long duration contracts. Um, and the government is going to play a better role for this perhaps than the private sector. Tenure really matters, not just volume. And 10 year and 20 year procurement programs will allow us to get the necessary private sector funds in and the financing that will be required to build these plants. Thanks very much. Thank you, Edward. That was super interesting. Are you looking for your pen? I found it right there. Thanks, Edward. That was a really great presentation. Um, as a reminder, if you want to go back and revisit the presentations, things will be posted at www.eesi.org uh, and uh, the video. And if you give us a couple weeks, we'll also have summary notes posted as well. So you can sort of skim 
the briefing as well. That brings us to our fourth panelist today, Sarah Wanis, works with the Ocean Conservancies, or excuse me, works within the Ocean Conservancies government relations team to advance priorities that protect the ocean and the wildlife and communities that depend on it. Uh, Sarah is passionate about building connections between the scientists and communities working on solutions to ocean and climate related threats and the legislators who can put these solutions into action. Sarah, welcome to the briefing. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello. Um, once again, my name is Sarah Wanis, and I'm here with Ocean Conservancy. And um, in addition to all of the really great angles that people have taken on talking about marine carbon dioxide removal today, I'm going to be focusing a lot on the research governance and the research needs um, moving forward with implementing ocean before as we implement ocean carbon dioxide removal. So just a little summary of the things that I'll cover today. I'll talk about some context on the marine carbon dioxide removal research needs, um, what responsible development and scaling of U.S. MCDR research would look like, what research governance would look like, monitoring, reporting, and, veri and verification complexities, and the need for a clear regulatory regime. So without further ado, let's jump right in and talk about the um, needs surrounding marine carbon dioxide removal research. As we move forward into this field, there are a lot of knowledge gaps that still exist of how we should be moving forward and how we will address concerns and questions as they come up. So what we really need to be targeting is research to support the decisions that people will be needing to make as we implement and study ocean carbon dioxide removal further. Just a few of those questions that still exist on this topic are things like what information is even relevant and what decisions um, and who will be making what decisions. When should activities be scaled up or closed out and who benefits and is anybody harmed? Um, how, does, how do marine CDR activities fit in among other marine uses and so on and so on? So these are some of the questions that we need to be addressing with our marine carbon dioxide removal research. And you might be wondering now how we can accomplish this. And one major way that we can accomplish this is through establishing a research code of conduct. Codes of conducts are a quite common tool in research fields as a way to create common norms and best practices and to encourage responsible research among public and private sectors. Codes of conduct encourage researchers to assess, minimize, and publicize impacts of their experiments and can reduce the harm done by field experiments. And by promoting principles that would encourage the growth of a rigorous body of research, such as requiring the disclosure of funding or the peer review and publication of results, a code of conduct could help researchers transparently and honestly determine the efficacy of ocean-based CDR technologies, which they need to be doing if these technologies are going to play a meaningful role in climate mitigation. This is a really great report that I have up here on the screen, that I have up here on the screen, um, which is a on the role of code of conduct could play in marine carbon dioxide removal research and what that code of conduct might look like to be effective. It has um, more than it has 10 authors from disciplines spanning ocean science to anthropology to law and policy and more. And our very own um, Sarah Cooley at Ocean Conservancy is one of those experts on this report. So diving in a little bit more to what that report said and what a code of conduct for marine carbon dioxide removal research would look like. We can boil that down into three phases of that responsible that should be described by that of code of conduct. It starts in the planning stage where we should be really considering whether, when, where, and how to conduct this research. These questions will span considerations in project design, identifying work, uh, identifying and working with stakeholders, identifying physical and social impacts, siting, and permitting. Once the planning questions are worked out, there are considerations in execution. Projects must be monitored for both their positive and negative impacts, and we need to make sure that these projects have appropriate levels of accountability and liability and transparency around the impacts the tests are having, as well as checkpoints around how to decide when to scale up or when to scale back. On the slide here, it shows this is a direct arrow going through the conclusion, but it really could show an off-ramp here from conclusion, or it could show a loop back up, back into planning. Uh, because this last uh, um, this section describes considerations for concluding a study, which could include decommissioning, or it could move into further study of and research on different hypotheses or on different scales. 
And depending on the outcomes, uh, it could include uh, remediation of any adverse effects of the studies or the fair distribution of any benefits of these studies. Um, in any case, it should also include the communication of results with other scientists and with communities. So now you're probably how that's wondering how this work applies to Congress and how Congress can have a role in the implementation of a research code of conduct in a field that is incredibly international. One possible point of influence that Congress can play and uh, has in this is Congress as a funder of research. Funders have a key role in encouraging the widespread adoption of a code of conduct, including they can require the documented use of a code of research code of conduct in order to qualify for funding. More development would be needed on the code of conduct developed in the Aspen Institute report that I showed earlier, but the goal is to create an, a document that has elements relevant to the implementation in both field and or lab or model studies, and Ocean Conservancy is committed to continuing on that work. Um, funders can also require adherence to permits and protocols, for example, environmental permits and uh, for field studies, which we saw with the NOAA NOPP awards that were made last year, or Institutional Review Board or IRB approval for living subject studies. We've noticed that there's been really good back-end coordination between NOAA and the EPA on those kinds of field, um, permits for field studies so far, which is a great sign in this field. Um, funders can also require and support data sharing and establishment of reasonable rules around intellectual property. The challenge with intellectual property is to give startups a chance to have something that's proprietary to offer, but not to allow the privatization of, da of data about carbon cycle baselines or environmental outcomes that would not only shed light on the full outcomes of a company's approach, but would also provide important information for other MCDR researchers and verifiers. Funders can also tie future funding to past performance, which I know sounds a little bit harsh, but um, NSF does have rules uh, to this effect about data sharing already in place. Last but not least, funders can help coordinate research in, um, can coordinate the research community in many ways, such as the development of joint activities and resources. Some examples of joint activities and resources that could really pay off here include support for methods of intercomparison projects or the support to grow a verification system that's operated by neutral third parties. So far, we've talked about why it's so, uh, we've talked about how to get this research right. And I want to pivot a little bit back to why it's so important that we get this research right and talk about MRV complexities. Uh, if it would play a little bit better on the video, I might ask us all to shout out what MRV stands for because we've heard it a few times today, but um, because it probably wouldn't, I'll just um, say it for you. MRV stands for Monitoring, Reporting, and Verification, which is a really big challenge for MCDR. And, but it's also central to counting MCDR's contributions to greenhouse gas emission mitigation. So MRV is where we do the actual accounting of understanding how much carbon, how much CDR methods are removing carbon from the carbon cycle, uh, uh, are removing carbon from the atmosphere. Um, two words that I want to take some time to define here are additionality and durability. Additionality is meaning the additional amount of carbon that is being stored because of the implementation of these carbon dioxide removal research of uh, carbon dioxide removal methods, and it's not as simple as I know we were just hearing earlier, just counting or, or as you were explaining earlier, it's not as simple as just counting at the beginning how many carbon molecules are present in a system. We need to know how many additional carbon molecules are being sequestered because of the implementation of the carbon dioxide removal methods, um, which requires us to have a good baseline. Um, and durability, meaning how durable that carbon is stored, whether or not that carbon is going to be released back into the atmosphere is something that's important to know before we, we're counting something as sequestered. Uh, MRV is more straightforward for some methods than it is for others. For example, with direct ocean removal, um, as we've heard about already today, you're collecting carbon directly and you can count the molecules of carbon that you're storing and you can monitor that they remain stored. In other methods, such as alkalinity enhancement or seaweed cultivation and sinking that rely on ocean processes in an open ocean and atmosphere system, there are a lot more variables at play from how, even including how fast the seaweed is growing that can be more difficult to predict. Right now, there is no true MCDR MRV protocol. Um, the best that we have are models that are run by practitioners to approximate what their in situ method is able to do. Seaworthy is a startup that's working on creating a universal protocol, but MRV requires high quality regional to global scale observations, as well as nested regional and global scale models. 
without MRV, additionality and durability of carbon sequestration cannot be confirmed. The last thing that I wanted to talk about today was the uh, is something else that Congress has a role in, which is the need for a clear regulatory regime. Research governments and, per and permitting are evolving quickly at EPA. EPA is leading work on collaborat collaborating across agencies to determine how issue research permit how to issue research permits within the US EEZ. Agreements also needed on what constitutes responsible, appropriate, deliberate experiments and not implementation. Guidance is also needed to determine what constitutes unregulated or rogue behavior in this field. Code of conduct and best practices and best best practice guides are a good start to that work and maybe another step towards um, community and maybe another step is towards community established norms, funder imposed requirements or regulations requiring an external auditor. Other disciplines such as biomedical research um, may hold more inspiration for us um, as technologies move toward, from laboratory tests um, toward in-field um, use. And guidance is also needed about who holds authority over MCDR. Is it simply environmental permits or who has a say over whether any carbon removal achieved should be incorporated into greenhouse gas mitigation plans like, and, like our NDC. Last but not least, liability guidance is also needed. Um, who is liable for the outcomes of these experiments and how can we deal with the harmful or unintended, any harmful or unintended consequences? And are these things the same for both experiments and deployment? With that, I know that I've raised a lot more questions than direct answers, but I do also know that Ocean Conservancy is really committed to continuing to work with all of our colleagues and all of um, Congress on reaching answers to those um, solutions and or reaching answers to those questions, and we're really excited to move forward with that. Thank you all. No. No, I no, I <laughs> don't know anything about this stuff. Someone's going to ask me a really hard question or and you know I won't I won't have the answer I'll just you know I'll make you look bad um, our last panelist of the day is Gabby Kitch uh, Gabby is a marine geochemist who leads NOAA's involvement in marine carbon dioxide removal research she first joined NOAA's ocean acidification program as a John A. Knoss fellow focused on international policy during which time she began to support carbon dioxide removal efforts in her current uh, role at NOAA, Gabby manages the National Oceanographic, Oceanographic Partnership Program Marine CDR Research Portfolio, supports the development of actions outlined within the new Ocean Climate Action Plan, participates in various domestic outreach activities, and continues to track international engagement in the marine CDR space. And I know that we have other Kanak fellows uh, right now, so Nico, thank you for one, and uh, they do amazing work, and eventually they become ESI panelists. So, Gabby, I'll welcome you to the lectern. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to EESI. Thank you to WRI. And thank you to the wonderful panelists who set me up so well for this presentation. So now I get to focus on all the fun things and don't have to define a single term in my whole presentation. Um, so as I was introduced, I'm Gabby Kitch. I'm the Marine Carbon Dioxide Removal Lead with NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. And I would want to take just one moment to point out that I am located within the Ocean Acidification Program. This is largely due to what Katie mentioned um, as the, the benefits for ocean acidification mitigation that marine carbon dioxide removal potentially has. So it's an important distinction to point out. You all are very familiar with what has been going on on the Hill, and Savvy did a great job of walking us through the current carbon dioxide removal uh, policies that are on, in place right now. I just want to take one more moment to focus in on the Ocean Climate Action Plan, or OCAP, as many of us refer to it as. This was released in March of 2023, and in the Ocean Climate Action Plan, marine carbon dioxide removal was one of the actions mentioned in moving us towards a carbon-neutral future. And this is really important, um, especially because NOAA was outlined in nearly 75% of these marine carbon dioxide removal actions as the lead agency. Of course, we can't do it alone. Many other agencies are outlined in the Ocean Climate Action Plan as well. And the Ocean Climate Action Plan resulted in what Savvy also mentioned, the Fast Track Action Committee, or FTAC as we call it. Um, this FTAC was set up by 
the National Science and Technology Council, and now brings together about a dozen agencies across the U.S. government to write a research plan on marine carbon dioxide removal. So we have had a number of listening sessions throughout the month of March and one in April. And as Savvy also mentioned, we do still have a public comment period right now through a federal register notice. So we love QR codes. Um, if you want to check out that FRN, please scan the QR code. And uh, we welcome anybody to submit comment through that portal. So NOAA's role um, and mission in science, stewardship, and service is really key to its um, leadership in the field of marine carbon dioxide removal. NOAA has always invested in foundational climate research in terms of monitoring greenhouse gases, both in the atmosphere, but also in the ocean, climate impacts to ecosystem, and of course, climate models. With this perspective, NOAA wrote a carbon dioxide removal research strategy, which was published in June of last year, 2023. Another QR code here. If you haven't had the opportunity to check out our research strategy, I do encourage you to um, scan this QR code and take a look. This will take you to a landing page, which has a couple of different resources. I didn't bring any handouts, so this is your avenue to the resources um, where you can, have, you can find a two-pager um, that summarizes the research plan, but also the full research plan. And the research plan really takes you through four different aspects of carbon dioxide removal research. First, it starts with the federal motivation for carbon dioxide removal research, which we briefly went over, and Savvy did a really great, robust overview of that. We also go through the state of the science, which is ever-evolving, so do not fault us if it is now out of date already, um, not even one year later. And then the third part of it really goes through NOAA's assets that could be um, expanded to support the marine carbon or the carbon dioxide removal ecosystem at large. And I'll take a second to go through those in just a minute. And then the last aspect of this is really a vision for carbon dioxide removal research at NOAA. And this is not assuming um, that, you know, we need carbon dioxide removal research that's outlined in the other parts of the plan. But indicating if the field moves forward and is scaled and is commercialized, how NOAA envisions it could play a role in supporting the field. What that largely has to do with is these existing assets that NOAA has. So this is a simplified version of table two in the full strategy. And I'll quickly walk through these four different bins here. So we have um, our observing networks, which of course are um, kind of the gold standard for observing atmospheric and oceanic greenhouse gases. We also have our modeling um, capabilities that can really focus on the projection, uh, different climate projections and impacts to ecosystems of those various projections. Those two together um, are what underpin the foundation of an accountable marine carbon dioxide removal ecosystem, right? So we're talking about selling carbon credits. Um, Sarah did a really great job of discussing MRV and our need to understand a baseline uh, carbon you know, dynamics in the ocean. These two are, are the keys to unlocking those markets and, and the accountability for those, um, those different aspects. Third, we have our ability to assess environmental impacts. And so we have shown this through our laboratory involvement in um, looking at ocean acidification impacts, for instance. And this involves, you know, modeling, laboratory research, and large tank experimental research along within the field. We also have our decision support products, right? We like to pr provide services to the public. So these range from data management, um, what it means to actually upload and archive uh, ocean data in a long-term uh, site and how we can then expand that to incorporate marine carbon dioxide removal research. That is key, again, to this accountability picture, but also to moving the field forward in an equitable way um, for the global community. We also have marine spatial uh, planning research and services that are provided, and I can talk more about those in the panel if you are curious about that. And I'll also point out these assets are spread across the agency, not just within one office, even though I am representing my office here today. Um, so it's a very important point to, to call out. 
Um, and I will note too, right now we have very limited investments that are going to expanding these assets. We can currently just maintain what we have been investing in um, to support that foundational underpinning of the ecosystem. So many people mentioned this NOP program, and I will go through it in a minute, but I want to take a moment just to drive home one point here about the necessity of marine carbon dioxide removal research. So we know that the Earth and our ecosystems are currently feeling the impacts of climate change. I'm sure many of you have been reading you know, popular news stories about um, coral bleaching recently that NOAA's Coral Reef Watch has you know, quantified as unprecedented due to the you know, carbon pollution that exists in our atmosphere causing dramatic ocean warming this year. Yes, the risks of marine carbon dioxide removal research are there, and many of them might be unknown. But the risks of climate change are also very much here. So we are living in this risk-risk scenario, and what we can do in terms of marine carbon dioxide removal is expand the foundational research to better quantify uh, the risks in this research portfolio and be able to make decisions and form decisions in the future about deploying these different strategies. So with that introduction, I'm going to talk a little bit about our National Oceanographic Partnerships Program um, leadership. And this is really NOAA Ocean Acidification Program's lead here. But again, this would not be made possible without a lot of our interagency partners and also one philanthropic partner. So we leverage the National Oceanographic Partnerships Program in both fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, and I'll focus on the 22 portfolio first, as this is a little bit more robust, as you see from the slide. We ended up supporting 17 marine carbon dioxide removal projects for a total of $24.3 million. And this does include $14 million in Inflation Reduction Act funding. So even though there weren't necessarily flags and earmarks um, for IRA for marine carbon dioxide removal, we were able to leverage this under the um, Climate Resilience Accelerator Program. And what's really great about the NOP is that it's a multi-sector partnership. The eligibility requirements in this grant require applicants to be from multiple sectors. And this is really representative of the field here. As you can see from the panel, um, it's bringing all these different federal agencies, private partners, and academic partners together. So while we supported 17 projects, we in total supported nearly 50 institutions across the U.S. and one collaborator in Japan um, and 80 unique principal investigators. I'll quickly go over our 22 portfolio, which is just one project. Um, and this, was, this is a project that is led by the University of Washington in collaboration with the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and Ebb Carbon as the private partner. So all of our funding partners are listed on this slide. I do encourage you to check out this project search function as if you want to learn more about um, our research portfolio. This just shows the diversity of partners um, here. So with that, I'm going to wrap up here and just talk about what is next. Many of these points have already been discussed. So NOAA is directly involved in the FTAC. We are currently co-chairing the Fast Track Action Committee, and we have two members, myself included. We're also formalizing relationships with multiple agencies on marine carbon dioxide removal that goes beyond our funding uh, portfolio. So this includes the Department of Energy and also the EPA. Um, and then the big takeaway here is that our role and NOAA's role in Earth system observing is critical to determine if marine carbon dioxide removal is valid and responsible as a climate solution, right? We're thinking about defining the efficacy and the safety of these methods through our research portfolio. As a NOAA entity, we are currently drafting our, our own implementation plan that discusses concrete actions and prioritizes different actions within the agency. And we um, plan to work closely with the, the FTAC strategy on that. So with that, we can move to questions. Thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, and we have a fair amount of time for Qs. And we'll count on our panel for the As. So thank you very much. Um, 
let's see. I'm going to kick us off with just a, a quick overview question, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, and this one, and Katie, I think we'll come back to you maybe, and we'll start, and then maybe we'll move through the panel. But now that we've all heard the presentations from the five of you, um, do you have any more thoughts about sort of what to make of the uncertainties surrounding ocean carbon dioxide removal and how for folks in our audience today who are like having questions about these uncertainties, what, what should they be thinking about from like, um, uh, the perspective of how do we go about making decisions, policy decisions, funding decisions, you know, given the uncertainties, what's the, what are some ideas for the path forward? And then Katie, we'll hear from you and then we'll move through the rest of the panel and then we'll open it up. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think everyone kind of touched on the fact that there's uncertainties around the efficacy. How well do these approaches work? How, how quickly can they sequester carbon? Over what duration do they sequester carbon? Is it re-released at some point? And then also uncertainties around the ecological and environmental impacts, the social impacts of these, the ancillary impacts of doing these. So... Um, and I think, of course, all of these depend on the scale of the project, the location, probably the season, um, the duration of the project, how it's applied. So there's a lot of different factors at play here. And I guess one thing that we've been thinking about is if you, if you think about the uncertainty around efficacy um, and environmental impacts, it, they're kind of dependent on each other. Like if you know directionally that the efficacy is going to be positive, but you have less certainty about the environmental impacts, that can tell you something um, else rather than if you have no certainty about the directionality of the efficacy and no certainty about the directionality of the impacts. So maybe it's better to prioritize an approach that you're more certain is effective and then thinking about the impacts there. Um, but, but yeah, I think this is kind of the perennial question that comes up a lot is like, how do you, who gets to decide what, what a, a suitable threshold of uncertainty around the impacts or the efficacy is. How do you compare that to a business as usual kind of trajectory that um, Gabby mentioned? We're dealing with climate change, the risks of that versus the risks of potentially doing an ocean CDR approach that might have different types of impacts. So how do you weigh those different types of uncertainties against each other and who gets to decide that um, ultimately? So no, no real answer there. Just more questions, but I'm sure other panelists will have more to say on that. Thanks, Katie. Savvy? Yeah. Um, so I think I might tie it back to something Sarah said at the end of her remarks, which is there are a lot of questions right now with marine CDR. And um, not to, you know, keep beating on this, but research and development right now is super critical to better understand what are the power needs for a lot of these technologies. Right now we're working in labs and we're working in very controlled situations. When we take these out of the lab, they're going to function very differently and we don't know what those different anomalies could be. Uh, so power use, location, yes, we all think of the coast, but is there any infrastructure that we can leverage from the coastal areas? I know waste management treatment centers are one of the options that a lot of uh, um, companies are considering at the moment just because there's already sort of that built-in uh, capacity to retrofit maybe a system onto it. And then also, second thing I want to drive home is on the permitting piece. So um, Edward made a really good point that, you know, a lot of this can work today, but there's no clarity on how this process is permitted. And there are so many different types of marine CDR technologies that are emerging that every process will have a different permitting um, process as well related to it. So marine uh, or macroalgae sinking is going to be very different than electrochemical separation, for example. And I think that clarity is really, really important. And then lastly, to the MRV point, we really need to know how much carbon dioxide uh, we are removing and what the net removals are and, and the impacts on, on, this, um, on, on total carbon removed. Great. Thanks. Edward? So when we think about uncertainty, very rarely is the right answer in action. Right? And when we're thinking about a pending calamity, I can tell you now the right answer is not going to be standing still or red tape. So the, the right answer is going to have to be based and grounded in science, in facts and data. The right answer is going to have to be grounded in communities, those who are actually going to bring these projects 
within what they are doing and then allow for deployment at scale. And the right answer is going to have to be done at a pace that's commensurate with the actual challenge that we're all facing. So I, I'd flip it around and I think implore those who are listening to think through science and community and pace. And those three things need to happen. And, and that's the priority. And the uncertainty will be a wash once you've thought through those three. Thanks. Sarah? Yes, to piggyback off of that, one thing that there is a lot of consensus in the scientific community about is that we will need some form, some level of carbon dioxide removal in order to meet our, being the global hour, climate goals. And um, the uncertainty exists then in the implementation of these methods. Within that uncertainty, there's a uncertainty surrounding, surround, to the extent that the uncertainty is surrounding implementation, I think the answer to that is research um, and making sure that we have the data to back things up. To the extent that the uncertainty is surrounding the research, I think that we do know a lot around the kinds of things that we need to take into account that things like, to go back to my presentation, a code of conduct could address as we move forward with that research to make sure that we are doing this all with the best intent and not causing unnecessary harm. Great, thanks. And Gabby? Yeah, the panelists have done a great job setting me up once again. Um, so it's a great question about uncertainty. It's an emerging field. There are so many uncertainties in this field. But really, what I'm thinking about um, in terms of this Fast Track Action Committee process and also with our NOP research portfolio is field testing and what are the uncertainties that are prohibiting field testing and getting these um, projects in the water. And when that <laughs> question is asked, it's usually the uncertainty around what's happening with marine ecosystems, right? That's what the communities care about. That's what the other marine users care about. And also that's what we should care about as ocean scientists is what is going to happen with our ecosystems. There's not a lot of research right now. There, there is some research. Uh, maybe that just needs to be synthesized, but I would love to see a greater research effort focused on environmental impacts and ecosystem impacts. Great, thanks. And I think we had some questions in the audience. Um, and I have to go to Nico first because I have to go to Nico first, but then we'll go to in the middle of the aisle. And thanks to Megan, our policy intern, for being on mic duty today. Go ahead, Nico. What a privilege. Thank you. Um, my question is about MRV, which came up in basically everyone's presentation. Um, I'm wondering if there's any lessons we can glimpse from the terrestrial CDR space with regard to MRV and sort of what role you see policymakers or the government playing in regulating MRV, or do you see this being more of a third party regulatory role? For example, you know, should the federal government come up with standards for MRV, or do we want to leave that to the third party. So just curious if y'all have thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks. This is a free for audience questions or free for all questions. So whoever would like to chime in, please feel free. Lots of note taking you've triggered. It's going to be both. So it is both. Um, and for us, I think it comes back to that demand assurance piece. We need clarity over MRV. It allows us to then build larger and larger facilities and establish credibility with buyers. Um, so we are seeing what's working well in some parts of the globe. It's where you've got independence and you've got governments working together on the, the MRV piece. Great, thanks. Oh, go ahead, Savvy. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, there are currently a lot of uh, initiatives to better understand MRV from not just third parties, but the federal government itself. And so currently um, through DOE's FECM, there's the, uh, you know, Actually, no, it might just be through DOE as totality, uh, but carbon negative shot that's actually looking at MRV as well. And then the Office of Technology Transfer actually just put out an RFI, uh, I think last year, on better understanding what MRV looks like and, and what are some of the factors to consider. So it is being worked on in the federal uh, government and then also um, with nonprofits that are looking at how to better understand the frameworks for every different type of process. But I think there is something to be said about uh, a federal sort of stamp of approval that would help de-risk a lot of the um, uncertainties around MRV at the end of the day. So while we are figuring it out now, that is definitely needed. But at the end of the day, I think as it relates to some of the comments that were raised earlier of like what happens to this carbon once um, it's removed and, and when we purchase it, like right now, the voluntary carbon market has a lot of different evaluation metrics. And I think a lot of 
um, you know, varying levels of confidence. Whereas when we're trying to work on this now, I think we have the opportunity to work off a blank slate, basically. And so um, I would say federal um, sort of stamp of approval is, is definitely something that would be valuable. Great. Thanks. Go ahead, Gabby. Yeah. And just from the federal perspective, I will say that um, thinking about these kind of more standard operating procedures for monitoring reporting and verification is definitely a shared interest among multiple federal agencies, NOAA included. Um, given our existing assets for monitoring carbon in the ocean, we definitely would, you know, one of the vision points in our carbon dioxide removal research strategy is to act as a verifier for, you know, carbon going into the to the ocean. Ultimately, if we can't constrain this new carbon dioxide removal sink, we're failing at our mission to constrain the carbon cycle. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, the only thing that I'll add to all these really great answers is that because your question asked us, asked about land-based methods and how that translates to ocean, one thing that we'll always have to think about in translating land-based me methods to the ocean is the ocean will always be more international in nature um, and our solutions to these problems just by the fact that it covers 70% of the globe um, and uh, currents <laughs> exist. Um, so that's one thing to think about. Great. Thanks. And I saw you had uh, your hand up. I think you were maybe the first hand I saw go up. So take it away. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Nicole Gardner from the Foundation for Climate Restoration. First of all, thank you to all of you. You were really clear and very specific, which is very helpful in this sea of uncertainty. Sorry for the pun. Um, and I want to thank both Katie and Edward and Gabby for pointing out the uh, conundrum we're facing or the paradox of the risk-risk, nicely put, um, Gabby, of weighing the uncertainties versus the calamities that we're facing. So for all of you, what's the single thing you can think of beyond everything you've already said, which has been fantastic, that could push us forward faster? Our goal is to push forward the idea of the legacy load and the recognition that we need to get below uh, net zero by 2050 in order to and that's a pretty fast timeline. So what can we do to move ourselves along faster? Thanks. Gabby, would you like to start or is that too much? And then we'll move down the line maybe. I'm happy to start. And it relates back to my point about field testing. So I think really focusing on scaled research. So for those approaches who, that haven't had any foundational research yet, starting at the modeling stage, going to laboratory studies, then getting out into the water um, and making sure that we have efficient pathways to get to the point where they're testing responsibly in the water um, would be the easiest way to get us moving. Again, that takes resources and, and research programs and those types of things. I can't say I have anything to add to that. I will plus one that one. <laughs> Edward? Yeah, it's, it's price. Um, it's too expensive. It needs to be stimulated, demand stimulant for the market for high quality CDR. And until we get price lower, we won't see the volume. Savvy? I don't really have anything to add, so I'll just plus on to that. Yeah, agree with everything um, everyone else has said. I think, and I already said this, so it's not necessarily new, but I think more funding to do this research, to do the at-sea testing we need to see how these approaches work, under what conditions, what their impacts are. Um, I think also just more general education for the public. I guess we talk a lot about doing community engagement to um, inform the, these projects, but a lot of people don't even know what carbon removal is. They don't know what ocean carbon removal is. So doing more of that general outreach, I think it's also a question of who bears that burden. Should it be the government? Should it be local entities, et cetera? That could be a whole other discussion, but I think that's something that's also needed. Great. Thanks. Um, there's a cluster of hands. I saw you next. So I think you were... You might be the last question unless the question's real quick. And then I saw you next, so. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Lauren Barrett with House Science. Um, I think this question is for Gabby, but I welcome other chiming in. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to the state of the science in even doing the monitoring. And I'm thinking for things that are diffuse, more like ocean alkalinity enhancement. Is the technology even there to see those changes in carbon and to verify permanence or duration? And what do you need to make it better? <laughs> this is a great question. Um, and the quick answer is 
No, not yet. Um, and the Department of Energy's RPE launched a program, CCO2, that really focuses on um, exactly this question and thinking about different sensors that could be used for monitoring, reporting, and verification. Uh, so I think that's a very valuable program and one that we are closely working and coordinated with. But in terms of you know understanding what needs to happen, it's increasing like RPE is doing, increasing these sensors and um, the availability of these sensors, also increasing the ability for sensors to be outfitted onto autonomous platforms, right? We all love robots, self-driving cars. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it can definitely speed up the um, process of monitoring and the ocean rather than just doing shipboard assessments and also lower the cost in the long run. So there are a few key points there, and we could talk many more details about specifics in terms of the sensors available available, and what needs to be improved there. Great. Thanks, Gabby. Um, I think we can squeeze in one more, and I saw your hand go up. So, uh, Megan, we're in the front row. Megan, we're in the front row. Thank you. So just quickly, I think this might be for Savi, but we talked a lot about the regulatory hurdles, the investment needs, the, the new policies, the environmental um, degradation possibilities. Is there, I'm curious how you think about the differences between nature-based solutions and tech-based solutions, because most of that is around tech-based solutions, right? But there are current nature-based solutions and maybe more that can develop over time that won't have some of these same hurdles. So can you, do you have to put it all in one category or is there a way that you can think about it in different sections and move nature-based solutions forward in the interim while technologies are still being tested? Or, you know, how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I think you put it beautifully. I think that there's uh, a lot of different solutions out there, and we should be taking a technology inclusive approach. We shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in one basket because that definitely um, stimulates technology lock in, and sometimes we could be moving forward with the wrong either less efficient uh, solution or just more costly solution. And so making sure that we're looking at all different options and, and moving forward with, with the natural solutions because they might be more ready for prime time today um, is highly valuable. And, and, and I mean, an example of this is running tide. They are growing seaweed, which is a very natural process and um, allowing that to just uh, accelerate by, you know, intentionally moving forward with these projects and creating sort of a pathway forward for that is um, is valuable. But again, we need to understand these technologies as they work in scale, because of course, growing seaweed naturally is very different than growing seaweed intentionally. And that can change like ecosystems. And so um, there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered in, in that way. But um, I think that's why, you know, ensuring that permitting rubrics uh, outline, uh, outline different sort of pathways as they become ready for prime time um, is really valuable. And actually, my colleague, Jasmine Yu, uh, who helped co-author the uh, report that I mentioned earlier uh, on charting a course for Marine CDR, <laughs> is uh, is here. And so if you guys have any follow-up questions after, we'd be happy to stay behind and answer those. Great. Thanks. Gabby, did you have something you wanted to, or are you just looking eager? Just a quick point here um, that piggybacks off was how Bates was saying. Um, Nature-based versus engineered solutions are a little bit tricky in this space because a lot of pathways do augment, accelerate natural processes, just like you pointed out with the seaweed example. Ocean alkalinity enhancement is the same as Edward pointed out, right? This is a weathering process that happens on land, but I think people are just thinking about speeding it up. So those terms get a little tricky in this um, landscape. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, that I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but hopefully our panelists may be able to hang out for a bit and do some networking. But they deserve a round of applause because they did a really great job. Thank you. <laughs> such a great panel. It was such a great panel. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Representative Pingree for joining us via pre-recorded remarks. Thanks to her and her staff for making that possible. Just monster thanks to Senator Schatz's office. Senator Heinrich's office and the Senate Rules Committee for all the hard work they did uh, helping us with the room today. And uh, we really couldn't have done this without our friends at WRI with their partnership. So thank you so much uh, for uh, everything that you were able to do. And Katie, thanks for being part of our amazing panel today. Um, I also have a great set of colleagues at ESI. I'd like to thank Dan O, Dan O'Brien, because there's two Dans. Um, I'm Dan B. Uh, I'd like to thank Omri, Allison, Aaron, Anna, Molly, and Nicole for all their hard work pulling the briefing together today. We also have three great interns who will be leaving us soon, unfortunately, 
Emily, Kylie, and Megan, thanks for all your hard work uh, as well. And Troy, of course, we couldn't do this without you. Everyone watching our live cast today should say thanks right now to Troy for helping us with the videography. Um, before I wrap it up, I'm just going to put the survey up on the screen. If you would like to share comments about the session today, the QR code, we like QR codes too. Uh, the QR code will take you to the survey. Uh, like I said, we read every response. And if you have any feedback, if you were in our online audience and the sound was weird or something didn't look right, just let us know and we'll, we'll always do a little bit better. Our next briefing is on May 1st, and we'll be provide, uh, presenting this with our friends at American Rivers. And it's going to be really great. It's called Dams in Every District, Challenges, Opportunities, and What's Ahead. I'm mostly just excited about the pun opportunity in a briefing all about dams. I can't wait. Um, so don't miss that, May 1st. Uh, we'll also be on Capitol Hill on July 30th for the Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo Policy Forum and Reception. Um, and if you want to keep track of everything that we're up to, uh, subscribing to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, is a great way to stay in the loop and keep track of everything. We're a few minutes over. Sorry about that, but I think it was well worth it. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their amazing afternoon here in D.C., uh, and uh, we'll be back on May 1st. So thanks, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>